generally the way I like to moderate these sessions is in a more casual, uh, loose way. Um, introductions aside, I think we could just jump right into this because the concept of blockchain investing is something that could feed several conferences of its own. So um, maybe let's start with understanding a bit more um, your thesis in investing and how you came to this, and maybe a little bit about yourself. So His Excellency Gabriel, why don't you start with uh, describing your thesis and how it's changed over the years, and a bit more about your story. Well, uh, a big part about investing is, is doing the research that's required uh, in any particular asset class or, or commodity that you're buying. And obviously over the years, um, things have dramatically changed in our industry. Previously, when I think back to the very beginning, we had Bitcoin. And then after that, it started, uh, you had your Feather Coins, Terra, Namecoin, the original, um, the original set of cryptocurrencies that came out. But then eventually Ethereum came, and with that came a whole new wave of cryptocurrencies into the market. And it's changed from the perspective of just do your research and look for good quality projects to now look for good quality projects that, that have great teams, uh, viability, access, um, network, and who really is also backing them. And that concept has fundamentally changed. But in, in the new capacity right now that I currently serve, which is the Ambassador of Barbados, the criteria has fundamentally changed on how I view investments. And particularly, it's one where uh, there's a very big priority on foreign direct investment into the nation of Barbados. And it's one where it's not just looking at investing in Barbados or getting persons from this part of the world to invest there in the traditional asset space, um, whether it's your hotels, your land, uh, real estate, etc. But it's now how can Barbados leverage its infrastructure? How can it, it leverage its capacity in the space of technology to gain investment for job opportunity, for jobs, opportunities, um, for growth? So this new mindset that, I, that I'm now sitting with in the last few months has fundamentally changed the way that I also look at projects. When I look at a project like Phantom, one of the first things that come to my mind right now is what can Phantom be used for as a utility within the nation of Barbados from a government perspective? What can be built, with, whether it's a registry per perhaps, uh, a real estate uh, tokenization project, but the idea has changed fundamentally from me as a private investor in the past, where I would have wanted to buy Phantom to now uh, at a government level, where can we leverage this technology for the nation's gain? For sure, and it's important. I mean, in a governmental role, your primary concern is protecting and improving the lives of citizens in the nation of Barbados, and looking at these projects and seeing which ones can help assist that is important and really a part of the, the mandate that you're given. Um, what's important about what you said about looking at a project, I mean, so many different cryptocurrencies have come along and versions of them have been better, faster, stronger, more robust. Looking at this, looking at the Phantom ecosystem, it was really interesting when you first told me about it. Um, I listened to you a lot, and when you're gonna throw your weight behind a project, there's gotta be a good reason. And looking at Phantom is better, faster, stronger, is part of it, but what else made you so excited about this particular cryptocurrency and the, the, the platform that's built? Sure, so I'll, uh, I'll kind of answer the first uh, question that you asked, Gabe, just kind of even how I, how, um, you know, because I think by, by going back a little bit about the history of kind of how I got involved in cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, yeah. Ethereum, it, it, it'll kind of help because uh, to, to me, the base of all, almost all crypto, and like Roger said yesterday in the conversation, it's all, always about a trade. So when you run a hedge fund, um, so how I got into Bitcoin first was, you know, I bought my first Bitcoin at $60. Everybody thought I was crazy, I got a Bitcoin, I have an Avalon ASIC miner from, from the original days, and it was making, I think, uh, 10 Bitcoin a day. So 
when, you know, when I first discovered Bitcoin, I was like, okay, how do I get more of this? Then I discovered, you know, obviously Mt. Gox and, you know, Bitstamp and Coinbase. And my first foray into cryptocurrency was Bitcoin was just arbitrage trading. So I wasn't really cared, cared so much about Bitcoin underneath, but just the inefficiencies in the system. So anytime there's an inefficiency in the system, it means it's a relatively nascent stage of an industry. And as the industry continues to grow, arbitrage opportunities disappear. Um, and this was kind of the case, like stable coins were really, really the equalizer, I think, for, for arbitrage because there's a lot less opportunities in arbitrage now with Bitcoin and USDT. So as assets become more mature, you're, you're now swimming in a, I, I think I'd like to call it like a red ocean opportunity versus blue ocean. So I've always believed in focusing on blue ocean opportunities. So, uh, so I've been doing this for about eight and a half years now and my Investment strategy always before was I want to be able to make money when the market goes up, down, or sideways. So quantitative like hedge fund trading was like a huge, huge advantage. But then I saw all my friends in 2017 that were doing ICOs. We were one of the largest OTC brokers. I made most of my money um, brokering the Bitcoin and Ethereum and converting it to fiat. That's where I made my money. But then I invested in, I was fortunate enough to invest Block One, um, EOS, Cardano. <clears throat> during those periods. And it was in 2017 that I learned that when you're in a bull market, you just need to pick one or two winners. And the number one failure, um, I think, of even entrepreneurs is lack of focus. So I take the same methodology when I, when I invest. I concentrate my bets. And Phantom was very, very unique for me because when it started off, it was almost kind of like, like everybody said before, it was just like another altcoin, another shitcoin. Um, but it was really, really unique. There was, there was a, the team behind it. And when I looked at everything, you know, Cardano was great, EOS is great, they had all these great platforms and, and it's really, really fast. But EVM was really the key uh, point for me when I saw what Phantom was doing. But I didn't see that until Andre had actually built Wi-Fi. And that's when I had that aha moment. I'm like, oh my God. These guys built Phantom and EVM and blockchain first, and I was running one of the validator nodes. So it was at that point, I made the conscious decision, sold everything, except for like my block one investment because um, it's not liquid. You know, I have some blockchain capital left, but I had to exit my positions at Cardano, EOS, everything. I sold everything and I went 100% into Phantom. Sold my LaFerrari, crashed that one by the way, and sold it, bought Phantom. I had a McLaren P1, sold it, bought Phantom just continued to just keep buying Phantom, accumulating even our hedge fund position last year. Protocol Ventures Quant and um, uh, Quantum Fintech Group, right now, uh, they've become almost like just Phantom ecosystem funds because our thesis even when we started these hedge funds was in a bull, in a bear market, we'll trade sideways, leverage using futures, you know, kind of electronic market making, but in the event of a bull market, we're gonna switch to a buy and hold. And that strategy is completely paid off. But then what I realized was, now my trade is a different kind of trade. The way I produce alpha as a hedge fund manager is to take all the experience of all the years that I have as a software engineer. And my edge and my advantage is doing stuff like this event, bringing people together, building new projects. So I'm taking almost a quasi venture angel investor startup approach to an industry that's completely liquid. Yeah. So that's my investment thesis. And it's changed a lot. I mean, yeah. we've, we've known each other for a long time and the years that you were doing the algorithmic trading and the, there wasn't a whole lot of sleep that you got. And now no. you're taking a long-term vision. It's a bit more, um, it's a bit more balanced. But the, what I, what I want to talk about is a bit more of the, the, the long-term view both from a government side and as an investor, mm -hmm. uh, there isn't really a concept, besides for certain companies where you can take equity positions in, like Block One, um, there isn't a Series A seed funding, Series B, Series C, and going public with crypto. I mean, it can go from a pre-sale to Binance in a second, and it's only getting faster, and these inefficiencies are being removed. At, at what time and how do you view projects like in stages in this industry? and And... For you running, um, working with so many projects and bringing them to the region, how are you saying, okay, this, this is already in its 
this is in its infancy or this is a mature project, what does it take to become a mature project that can bid on a governmental contract for the government of Barbados? Okay, and I think that's very important, but I, I, I first want to correct my title. Um, I'm, I left BIT since last year, Mo, uh, so I, I just, I think it's pretty important to note for the, for the audience. Um, so in, in my current capacity uh, as the ambassador of Barbados and also an entrepreneur from the blockchain space in the past who has successfully brought projects to life, I think it's very important on the reason why someone like me would attend a conference like this is because when you look at these type of technologies, it's less about investing in them, which um, I don't get involved with. It's more about what is coming out of these technologies, what is coming out as products. Um, so when you're looking at, at the various audience members made up of developers and you see them building different projects, you look at those projects from a position of innovation, uh, a path of pioneering, and then think, how could this be applied to, to my nation so that the people, the government, and the corporations of that nation could implement it in a different type of way and get ahead. Now, obviously, the technologies themselves are still new. Uh, the projects coming out from this um, type of event are, are relatively still in their young phases, but eventually they start to get a level of traction, and that traction that one would be interested in is uh, the products in MVP mode, there's a couple of users, it's being battle tested. The next thing would be, well, how could that be applied to a particular government instance or a corporate instance that then has the upswing? And at that stage, you would want to align the two where you would see a developer in the audience doing something quite incredible and you would want to spark that idea of, well, hey, you're doing something that I think can apply to this particular area of government. Would you be interested in having that conversation? And at that point, you try to align the two, and it, it would probably take 12 to 24 months before something comes to light. But when it does come to light, the level of impact that that can make on a nation state is dramatic. It can make the difference from the savings of a country in the millions to billions. It could increase uh, the gross domestic product of a country. It could reduce the expenditure on the citizenry. Um, and all of these different types of, of events that benefit uh, the people of Barbados are the types of situations that governments would look for. So from my particular perspective, I see these types of events uh, and, and particularly technologies as avenues towards successful growth for our people. So from an investment perspective, it's not from the now, but it's what's coming in the future that's really important. And that's what you have to look for because a, a, a relatively good investor, yes, they, they prepare um, for the now, but they, they, they invest because they see the future. And it's coming to these types of places that you get a glimpse at what the future could look like. View Harry, uh, uh, this same question is for you. Um, a lot of these, you know, a lot of these companies are mis mispriced just because they're in their infancy, and you've taken Tomb and done some great things with that, and other projects that are here and that you're looking at. Are you looking only at these initial companies, or what, what does it take to get them to the next level and more mature? We heard a bit about it yesterday. Can you speak sure. About so. Yeah, my investment thesis is a little bit more interesting now because I think before, you know, as a you know as an engineer, I've gone through the whole you know heartache of trying to raise that angel round, yeah. always trying to get to the series A, B, C, D. I think that model still exists and is, is still very very important because you still have a lot of money from the old way of thinking in, v, in the VC world. Um, so just like uh, Phantom has, you know, bridges, a lot of the businesses that we're trying to build now, we want to kind of be able to help bridge that gap. So what I think you're going to start seeing, and I think um, I, I got the idea really from Uniswap and Balancer, um, and we're doing this now with some of the companies, such as like, you know, Zoo and Overdrive, Yoshi Labs, 
um, some, some of our investments that I advise, which is essentially, you know, before it's you have a company, but you have no crypto. Then Ethereum pioneered the whole concept of a DAO, and then, you know, governance tokens kind of came around. But if you look at Uniswap and Balancer, they all have corporations kind of behind them that are backed, because, but they just issue tokens. So we're taking a similar approach because at the end of the day, you still have to have that bridge between regulators and regulators don't really like working with a DAO because what's a DAO? Um, so if you tried to have a real estate investment fund as a DAO, like good luck getting it regulated. So I think the next couple years, what we're really, really doing here, and look, what you see here, this is a vision I had like, I had a dream about the future here in Abu Dhabi. When I first came here, I was like, one day I'm going to have all my friends in the crypto space come here. And I think between just the two of you, I'm like, guys, you got to come to Abu Dhabi. And I quote you saying, Harry, I would never come to Abu Dhabi. I've got better things to do. And you said to me, Harry, there's no way I would ever live in Abu Dhabi. Yet now you live here as the ambassador. So... My vision really is just even something like this to be able to bring everybody together. And I haven't even showed everybody here everything. You haven't seen that. You know, I've signed a 10-year lease for 20,000 square feet investing here. I'm probably looking at another floor. But by providing a healthy environment that people are familiar with, uh, because it's very, very scary going to another country. So all my friends, everybody that's here, you know, it's a nice intimate group. Part of it is why I invite people, I'm so generous to bring people here, is because I want them to see what this place is. But it's very, very terrifying to come here because people, just what you hear in the media about you know, the Middle East, most of it's not true. So now that I've gotten people here and I want to show them the future, now it's like, okay, we're thinking ne the next five to 10 years ahead. And you know, my hat's off to Gabe. Um, I own no real estate at all. And one of the biggest things he's always told me is you know, to... Um, you know, buy some real estate. So, so I said, you know what? Um, okay, well, now um, I'm interested. What should I do? And he goes, well, let's, um, you know, have you take a look at Barbados. How can you help build the future of Bar Barbados? So now I'm looking at, okay, how do we help Barbados become like the next financial center because capital is very, very mobile. So these are like the more interesting projects that now it's more about leaving a legacy, like longer terms. That's the vision I really, really want to do. And more importantly, it's all about people. I've never been to Barbados, but I believe in Gabe. I believe in the vision of what he's done before in the past. And that's all it takes is your friend or the, the relationship. And that's what this conference is also about is the relationships you meet here today, you may not leverage them today, but you keep that friendship strong over the years. It just gets better and better and better. And I'll show you an amazing picture. There was a CZ and I back in 2014 we're supposed to do something together. They're supposed to come work with me on the hedge, on the hedge fund, but he did Binance. Like, thank God he picked that decision instead. But now we're back here connected again, and you know, we're doing stuff with Binance. So I think long-term thinking is a very, very important thing, and I've completely changed the way I do things now. I, I trade a lot less, and now I think about investing in people and entrepreneurs and really building for the future. That's, that's how I trade now. Everything you're saying resonates well with me. The first time coming to Dubai in, in 2014, it was the two months after Bruce Fenton made the first blockchain conference here. Um, as many of you have experienced here at the Emirates Palace, and you'll be shown no matter where you are in the United Arab Emirates, the generosity, warmth, welcoming nature of the people, um, but also from a business setup, um, when you are ready to dedicate time and resources to setting up a company and setting up a structure here where you can work, they, are, they will open the doors for you no matter what you do. And early on when I was here, and I, I realized that pretty quickly, that the government is wanting to be a partner with you and help innovation and help create incubators and accelerators for people that are doing interesting things. Um, and it was the first place in the world that was open to have blockchain companies register. And, and when you make a company in an in blockchain. Now it's a little easier, but five years ago, six years ago, you couldn't make a company, you couldn't register, you couldn't get a license, and it was super risky because any moment your company can be shut down by regulators. And so over the years, there's been some geopolitical arbitrage of where am I going to set up my company, which is going to be the most crypto-friendly place. Switzerland won 
for, for a year or two as the Ethereum Foundation. In Zug, there, yeah. Zug in, was, in Zug in Switzerland. Yeah. Um, the Ethereum Foundation, and they, they did well and they were winning for a while. And now um, Dubai and Abu Dhabi, thanks to, to you guys, are uh, becoming centers and thanks to the great work in, in Dubai with the Future Barbados Foundation. In the future. And thank you for like ADGM, Future Foundation are both places that are incubating helping companies. Um, if you're looking at a company that isn't registered or isn't in one of these places, or how would you help companies set up? And, and there's plenty of developers here that are having the same questions, which people in the audience are from all over the world. What advice would you give them to say where you should set up and what you should be doing to, to make things happen in a safe way? Sure. So, uh, yeah, I'm happy to answer that. So first, um, I think it's important everybody kind of Google this thing. It's called the five flags rule. Um, it's, and this is kind of like an older classic thing that one of my, my friends told me where Sorry, you have. This is the five lines rule? Five flags. Five flags. <laughs> five flags. Uh, so five flags rule is, um, you know, you have one that's kind of like your home country you live in. One is kind of like a safe passport. One's for like, you know, for tax, this kind of thing. Um, so for example, I'm Canadian, one of the best passports in the world, but I have a UAE residency, you know, for taxes. But, you know, being from Hong Kong, you know, I have Hong Kong, Taiwan passport, that kind of thing. So it's... To me, it's important to have more than one place that you kind of call, call home. And that's tough for a lot of people because that means stepping outside of your comfort zone. So what I, why I tell people it's important to at least come to the UAE, especially if you're in the blockchain space. This, I, I could have I had my pick of the litter any place I could have lived in the world. The US, I've lived in Silicon Valley, New York, Vegas, Miami, New York, Toronto, Hong Kong, Singapore. And when I came to Abu Dhabi, it, was, it wasn't even Dubai. Like, I love Dubai. It was a, a lot of fun. And, you know, we go to Dubai all the time. But for me to really kind of, you know, want to build a multi-billion dollar business, this was the place. Because, first off, it's one of the safest places in the world. There's so much space to grow. You've got about four trillion in sovereign wealth funds here. You know, you've got Adia, Mubadala. You know, you've got the Royal Group, which is, you know, like the Berkshire Hathaway or the UAE. They have like 800 billion in assets. So just having that here, and you know, there's a really, really close relationship with the US. Um, for entrepreneurs, I think setting up here, you know, Dubai, you know, Abu Dhabi, you know, even Barbados, like well, working in Barbados. Your Excellency, yeah. what is the approach then with Barbados? Is it, I'm assuming it's much more cooperative than competitive, but to bring more businesses, or what, what is the discussions happening about bringing more companies that are involved in innovation in the blockchain space to Barbados? Uh, well, let's, let's actually touch on our theme here at Expo 2020. The Barbados theme uh, for our pavilion is from sugarcane to blockchain. So the country is quite uh, definitely thinking along these lines, um, especially after seeing the successes of companies like BIT. Um, it's, it's realizing that technology is the future. And I think what's important, if I can quickly just step back, and part of the reason that this was a target jurisdiction for us is because, as Harry said, the United Arab Emirates is very forward-thinking. As you noted, they were one of the first to start uh, enabling blockchain companies. And a country like Barbados wants to uh, participate in that. But more importantly, we want to look at the next generation of cross-border collaboration. Uh, and I think it's very important that when you think about how do two countries collaborate, you have to appreciate that they could utilize the same said technology that corporations are using. They could pioneer the same way that individuals and companies are pioneering. So when you think about the next generation of, of uh, events that take place between two nations, whether it's cross-border currency exchanging or settlement of commodities or identification, um, authorization. I can go down a list as long as my arm of various ways that Barbados and the United Arab Emirates can enter into a new digital diplomacy arrangement to start pioneering different types of technologies, which is why conferences like this are so important and so interesting to someone like me, not just because of my passion for blockchain, but because I want to explore what are the new ideas coming out and how could they be adapted 
in a way that benefits that cross-border collaboration? How could we apply that same sad technology in a way that benefits not just Barbados, but the United Arab Emirates? And how do we ensure that we utilize that in a way that uplifts the people and the corporations there? Now, in terms of investments, if I can step back again further, one of the key things that developers can take away from here is that you have a very enabling nation like the United Arab Emirates willing to allow you to have a home, willing to allow you to have a safe place to operate, um, various regulatory regimes that um, are all for thinking with great frameworks coming out to support the initiatives that come out of your head. And what's important with that is once you have that initial footing, since we're talking about blockchain investment, you could then look towards this government or the government of Barbados to apply that pioneering activity. And once you have that relationship with the government, you become so much more attractive to investors. Investors are, are more than likely to back you in a project when you're working with a government than when you're not. So I think that's pretty important to note. And I would say that the government of Barbados and the country in general is open for business. We would like to see more pioneering happen in the country, but more particularly, not just companies that set up an offshore center, but countries that get involved, they get integrated, they participate. And one of the visions that I have is that we can try to strive towards that integration as a cross-border integration, where you're positioned in the UAE, but also in Barbados. And maybe that happens in a virtual space. And so that's the areas that we're looking at. And how, how, would, uh, how would that work in the virtual space? Uh, well, with, without you know, giving away the full picture, uh, you would enter into a new collaboration um, uh, between the two nations that happen at the government level, um, the international corporation level. And at that stage, uh, you know what? I can give you a basic example. If we think about the regulatory sandbox, yep. if, if the regulatory sandboxes between Barbados and United Arab Emirates were aligned, Harry or any developer in this room can establish their business within that regulatory sandbox in the UAE and by default, it's automatically accepted in Barbados. And therefore, you have the ability to operate out of both jurisdictions within that environment. So that's one, that's one basic example of how the two nations can collaborate and how an entrepreneur can have their foot in both nations at the single time. Obviously, the idea can be built upon further, and there's many more innovative uh, thoughts around how this can be accomplished, and it's still very early days. Uh, Barbados is only now having its very first diplomatic mission in the United Arab Emirates um, ever. Uh, so this, this is still very early days for us, but the idea is how could we adopt technologies to benefit the future of digital diplomacy? What, what's an interesting concept which we haven't seen too much of, um, in the Emirates, there's many public-private partnerships. Building out uh, large venues, complexes, are sometimes public-private partnerships. Um, in, in other countries, they also have public-private partnerships. We haven't yet seen too much public-private partnerships in the blockchain space. There's been pilot projects working with governments, for sure, around the world. Uh, Phantom itself has been working with governments around the world. It's like a, <laughs> as a pilot project, but um, how soon and how far away are we from a public partnership and an equity ownership in, from a government into some of these blockchain projects? You want me to answer? Sure. Yes, yeah, so some of the things that we're looking at doing definitely, um, again, why do I run a hedge fund? Well, hedge fund is an it's an investment vehicle that allows people that really have a lot of money in one part of the world to get access to returns that are in this side of the world, um, which is the crypto world. So my life, at least in crypto and the financial side, when I'm not building stuff and engineering is, how do I bridge the gap? So I th e even in Barbados, some of the stuff we'll be doing, um, investing in the region, we'll be setting up like, you know, real estate funds that are, you know, the traditional real estate fund structure and 
through, through investing in those vehicles, part of the investment thesis will have blockchain related to, because, because everything that I do is blockchain related. Yep. So I think those vehicles, you're gonna see a lot more of them because it allows people to think in one way without really kind of understanding the other piece. So you can almost think of the, the new wave of investing, even our hedge fund, and uh, you know, we announced a million dollar hackathon last night, and just even this environment gave me that idea that, okay, the financial industry we all know is kind of broken. Um, we run a hedge fund, actually probably like, probably just under a billion for the hedge fund, but in total we manage about two billion in assets now. We can't have real time reporting right now because the current fund administrators are not comfortable with dealing with blockchain. So we're a forward thinking in the blockchain space, but we can't, it, it's a very, very simple problem to solve. That's why I want to throw a million bucks at it because it solves an actual current problem. So the problem is we want to be able to have tra traditional people want access to this, but they can't even get that information in real time from, from the investments. So I think you're gonna start seeing a lot of that where there's a, now, there's a new art inefficiency. The inefficiencies are the structures of the funds themselves. Because the reality is if you put money into something in, in blockchain, it's relatively liquid. Um, all the data's there, why can't I get it right away? It's because at, at least the institutional level, it still hasn't been done yet. So that's what this hackathon... Do you see, do you see the governments for. taking positions in some of these new structures? A hundred percent, yes, because sovereign wealth funds, everything else, they're going to they're gonna want to have a little bit of their asset allocation, you know, investment in the commodities, maybe, you know, five or ten percent that will help outperform the market. And if they want, you know, a blockchain... I'm not talking about fund. them taking a position in, in treasury management. I'm talking <clears> about taking an equity position in some of these foundations and companies that are being built. The, the, ans the, answer, is, the answer is yes. Um, I, I see a, a situation, and it's firsthand, I'm seeing it from multiple governments, of where we have private-public par participation, PPPs, that you were asking about earlier. It's absolutely something that's coming down the <clears> pipeline where... And even in some cases, you have state-owned enterprises that are being established to take on these types of, of technologies. Um, it's very important to note that there are PPPs that do exist right now with blockchain companies and governments. Um, but what I think is more interesting, and remember the technology we're talking about here is blockchain. It's decentralized. It doesn't really have a border in terms of where it can operate and how it can operate. And I think what we're about to see is BPPPs, um, which are bilateral private-public participations, where it's not one nation getting involved with a particular technology, but where we're seeing multiple nations come around and agreeing to get involved with a technology together. And I think that is very close to happening. That is close to happening, where there's going to be multiple bilateral um, pri public-private partnerships happening. Are you seeing it more from the government will create an, a corporation to reduce risk and not have not have exposure to positions, or will you say, you know what, the the government of uh, some other place, or like that that Italy would start taking a position in a in a blockchain company publicly, or would Italy create a sub -con a sub corporation so they can r limit their risk? It's not about limited risk. It's all about, in, in many cases, legislation, where government may not be able to own, via legislation, a private corporation or participate in it. And that's why you have state-owned enterprises. How do we get past that? Um, or is it important that we get past that? Well, it, it depends on the nation and, and if they go and review their legislative framework and what they can and cannot do. It's, 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 it's from definitely from a position of risk, um, and from a position of ensuring that uh, there's no conflict of interest per se, you will see many circumstances where these things are revised more often than, than in the past because the, the, the reality is, is that the lines are being blurred right now between governance and government. And what this technology applies to do is in governance. So when you have someone like Harry saying, hey, this particular product um, called fund administration, that's a regulated product and a license you can apply for. It's grossly flawed 
in how it works for funds, um, maybe the government should revise how that works and move towards a more automated model. So these might be events where you're automating an industry and as opposed to the government trying to create a product, they might adopt a product. Is that your is that is it part of the approach like the, the one of the goals of building these things not only as a personal solution it's a solution for the industry and governments around <clears> the world. Yeah, so it's interesting because yesterday you know when I was on a panel here with uh, you know the Phantom Foundation and I was asking you know what why do they do the stuff that they do how do they you know get over that initial roadblock and it's just well there's bad people so bad people create problems so when people create problems for you then they give you problems to solve. And it really, really got me thinking yesterday. I was like, uh, shit, excuse my language, but uh, we have a real problem right now. We can't report stuff in real time. Uh, this is a real thing. It's actually, it actually can cost millions of dollars. I'm not the only hedge fund that has this problem. So just that alone, I'm like, you know what? You know, we had our breakout rooms and we came up, I came up with this idea like, you know, one in the morning and we kind of went through it. Where's the Cheetah guys? Are they here? Are they They're probably sleeping. We have beds there. Yeah, yeah. I, I put a bed in the uh, hackathon room with all the 15-inch monitors. And, but that's the environment I wanted to create. Uh, uh, you know, the, the idea, stuff that I've always wanted to work on. I, w I really had time to sit down yesterday after the conference and think about, okay, what problem <clears throat> can I help solve that will make my life better, but probably have a bigger impact longer term? So solving your own problems, sometimes you help, help other people solve problem. So just even this conference, bringing everybody here, it gets you out of the zone, the, the mindset that you're used to being in. And, you know, lo and behold, that's kind of how I came up with the idea. But yeah, solving my own problem first, sometimes just by default, it solves other problems. And that's the beauty about technology and innovation. Uh, you know, G Gabe, in helping me sol um, solve my real estate asset problem, it's creating a whole new era, but it's that spark. So I'm never usually the guy that comes up with an idea, but if my friends have a great idea, I'd be like, I'm an execution guy. I'm never the idea guy. If you tell me to build a bridge from here to Mars, I would say what, carbon fiber or plastic? That's what I'm really, really good at. But I don't usually come up with the original idea. <clears throat> we are gonna close in two minutes, maybe some final thoughts. Um, for the audience? Um, well, if we're giving final thoughts and sticking with the theme on blockchain investment, I would, I would put it out there to, to many in the audience that, of course, when you are looking to build um, innovation and pioneer towards a new path, that it is sometimes daunting to raise capital. But if you are, as Harry mentioned previously, looking to solve existing problems with a solution, it does lend for a very good position and a very good foot to start on. I would further say, and just again, in the capacity of my role, that governments do need solutions just as much as citizens do. And it's a very good place to look, particularly in, in regions or countries that have leadership, that have the appetite to want to see efficiency, that want to see transparency, that want to see growth and job opportunities. So I would say that a very big focus should be towards those types of, um, those types of, of government relationships and to uh, look at going down the path of applying said technology in that arena because I suspect that the world of BPPPs and PPPs in general are going to be the flavor of the year come next year. Because if we look back, we saw the nerd in his room or in his garage building a product seven, eight years ago. Fast forward five years ago, we saw the initial corporations taking placements. Um, three years ago, we saw the institutional investors getting on board. This year, we see the complete mapping of corporations, uh, Fortune 500 companies, you name it, all getting involved with this technology. We're starting to see the pilots happen with government, um, but it's not become mainstream of where many applications of governance are run on this type of technology. And I suspect that 
come next year and year after, that's when the windfall of government-based applications are going to come. And I think that's where a big part of the blockchain investments are going to be directed towards. Do you have any final thoughts, Harry? Um, <clears throat> well, first off, thanks, you know, Mo, and you know, for you guys for coming. Without you guys uh, here, actually, I probably wouldn't, wouldn't be sitting here. So thank you for bringing me to the, you know, the UAE in you know, 2016. Um, what Mo has done for me is really, really what I'm doing for <clears throat> a lot of you that are here for the first time. So my closing remarks are definitely take advantage of the conference network, make some relationships, invest in people because at the end of, of the day, that's what it's all about is the connection and, and people. And I think investing in people, you'll never go wrong. That's kind of like my closing comment. I don't have much of a closing uh, thoughts. I think we covered a ton of ground and investing in people and understanding the friction and inefficiencies from a government perspective and a, and a personal perspective gives people a great basis by which they can build amazing things. It's not about with picking which coin to buy, it's about picking good people, surrounding yourself with great people and solving real world problems that people are having or will have in the future. I'd like to thank my panelists and I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you everybody.